Welcome to the third session of the Women in AI Speaker Series, a collaboration between the Schwartz Reason Institute and Deloitte. The purpose of this series is to convene leading female researchers to share knowledge and mentorship opportunities for women across the technology sector with a particular focus on artificial intelligence. Participants will explore the development of new technologies and approaches and insights into cutting edge research from the perspectives of our esteemed guest speakers. To begin today, we wanna to take a moment to acknowledge the land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, Toronto has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit. These and other indigenous peoples across Turtle Island developed complex and effective governance systems based on respect for all life and the intelligence of the natural world. Today, this land is still home to many Indigenous people who are working to reclaim their rights to self-determination and self-governance, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to live and work on this land. Although we all may be joining from different places today, we encourage you to reflect on the history and relations of the land that you work and live on. Before we move into today's talk, I'd like to introduce our collaborator in the series, Aisha Green. Aisha is a senior manager at Deloitte's AI Institute focused on AI literacy and adoption. She is passionate about fostering partnerships which advance research and innovation initiatives and has worked closely with early stage entrepreneurs to commercialize medical devices, therapeutics and information technology applications. Welcome Aisha. Thank you, Kelly, and, and welcome to everyone who's joining us here today. So for today's session, we thought it to be uh, an interesting change, simply because decision making can be hard. And even when the stakes are high, we realize that sometimes having the idea or perspectives of a third party to evaluate even your loan application or to making a ruling for a legal procedure may seem like a welcome, unbiased view of your application. But to others, the concerns raised on how decisions are made can be problematic. In this session, we wanted to delve into how machine learning models make decisions. And from our esteemed speaker today, we will hear how AI, and specifically machine learning, is transforming how they decide. We'll also hear that what it means to be a woman within this space and how our speaker has navigated her career path to ensure that her work has a broader impact on the world in which we live. We hope that uh, the conversations that you hear today and the networks that you begin to foster through the conversations in this lecture begin to fuel how this section, this sector is vitally making changes for women and allies. With that, I hand it over back to you, Kelly, to introduce our lecturer for this session. Thank you, Aisha. A few quick notes before we begin. This session is being recorded. Our guest will speak for about 45 minutes and then we'll take questions after the talk. During the Q&A, we encourage all participants to use the raise hand function in Zoom uh, and app to ask your question. To facilitate the discussion, we invite you to please update your display name with your first and last name. Now it's my pleasure, real pleasure, to introduce Professor Cynthia Rudin, who is the Earl D. McLean Jr. Professor of Computer Science, Electrical and Computer Engineering, Statistical Science, Mathematics, and Biostatistics and Bioinformatics at Duke University. Cynthia directs the Interpretal Machine Lab, lab, Learning Lab. Previously, Cynthia held positions at MIT, Columbia, and NYU. She holds an undergraduate degree from the University at Buffalo and a PhD from Princeton University, and is the recipient of the 2022 Squirrel AI Award for Artificial Intelligence for the Benefit of Humanity from the Association for the Advancement of Artificial Intelligence, Triple AI. This is the most prestigious award in the field of artificial intelligence. Cynthia is also a three-time winner of the INFORM's Innovative Applications and Analytics Award, was named as one of the top 40 under 40 by Poets and Quants in 2015, and was named by Business Insider as one of the 12 most impressive professors at MIT in 2015. She is a 2022 Guggenheim Fellow, as well as a Fellow of the American Statistical Association, the Institute of Mathematical Statistics, and AAAI. Through her work in machine learning, Cynthia has received acclaim for her research examining biases in the black box models used in healthcare and criminal justice settings. And it is our sincere pleasure to have her with us today. Cynthia, the floor is yours. Okay, great, I'm gonna share my screen here. Here we go. And uh, my talk is called, Do Simpler Machine Learning Models Exist and How Can We Find Them? So I work in interpretable machine learning 
I started working in this field because I was working with the New York City Power Company, trying to predict power failures in, in Manhattan. Uh, and I realized that more complex machine learning models were not giving me any better predictions than very, very simple models. And so I thought maybe like the problem that I was working on was an anomaly, but it wasn't. The same thing kept happening again and again. So here's a, another example. Um, so back in 2015, we wrote this article called Interpretable Classification Models for Recidivism Prediction. And in this article, we use the largest public data set on criminal recidivism. So this is over 33,000 people. They were released from prison all in the same year. And we were using interpretable machine learning techniques to predict whether someone would commit one of a bunch of different kinds of crimes after they were released from prison. So these are misdemeanors, violent crimes, sexual crimes, property crimes, drug crimes, you name it. And what we showed in this paper is that we don't need a complicated model to predict recidivism. And race is actually not a useful variable in predicting um, whether someone will commit a crime. And in fact, yeah, um, that yeah, that's what we showed. So we were pretty surprised when a few months later, the ProPublica article came out and claimed that there is a proprietary model called Compass that's used widely throughout the US justice system, and it uses race. And we thought, hold on a second. First of all, race doesn't even predict recidivism. And second of all, these types of models should not be proprietary because they determine people's freedom. So we were wondering, like, how accurate is this model anyway, right? This, this compass thing, right? It's widely used in the US justice system. How accurate is it? And so we used the data that came from this article. Um, for, it was from Broward County, Florida. And we decided to do a head to head of, of compass um, versus uh, the latest machine learning method from our lab at the time of the data set release, um, the method from our lab is called CORALS, which is Certifiably Optimal Rule Lists. And CORALS is a very complicated algorithm, but it produces tiny little itty bitty machine learning models that can fit in the bottom of a PowerPoint slide. And so what I can do is show you the machine learning model that CORALS produced on this Florida data set um, that we were using to compete against Compass, okay? So it produced a model that was so tiny that it fits all the way down here. All right, so the machine learning model looks like this. It says, if your age is between 19 to 20 years old and your sex is male, predict arrest within um, three, two years of your compass score calculation. Else, if you are 21 or 22 years old and you have two to three prior offenses, then predict arrest within that two years of your compass score calculation. Else, if you have more than three priors, then predict arrest, otherwise predict no arrest. And we thought, oh boy, <laughs> like that is such a simple formula. Could that really be as accurate as this black box that's used in the justice system? And surprisingly, it was. Um, so here, what I'm showing you are the different um, accuracy scores from Compass and Corals. And then these different num colors here, um, we, did, we do tenfold cross-validation. So they're from different subsets of the data. So each color is like a different subset of the data. And so it's pretty clear that these are about equally accurate. So it's not clear to me why we need proprietary models in the justice system here, because they're, you know, it's, they're performing about equally well, um, black box versus corals. Um, and then we thought, okay, can we get any more accuracy out of this data set? So we threw the whole machine learning arsenal at this problem. And what we found is that they were all about equally accurate. And some of these are really complicated black box formulas, whereas Coral's whole model is like right in the bottom of the slide here. Like some of these are like boosted decision trees and support vector machines and so on. So there was this huge debate about the algorithmic fairness of Compass, but the truth is I think it was all misdirected. I think the truth is that we just don't seem to need Compass at all because it's, it's just so much harder to, to debate about whether it's fair because you can't see the inside of it, right? Um, so anyway, this is not the only data set where simple models perform well. In fact, it happens really often. So I'm going to show you another example. And this time, I'm going to choose a really high stakes example in medicine. Okay, so let us say that um, you have an aneurysm in your brain. So these are the blood vessels in your brain. You have an aneurysm, it bursts. So that means you've got a brain hemorrhage, okay? So you have blood leaking into your brain. That's what this is showing here. So what would happen to you is you would be 
sent to the hospital immediately, you would get emergency surgery to repair this, and then you would be placed in the intensive care unit where you would be monitored with EEG monitors all over your head. And those monitors would be detecting for the possibility that you might have a seizure. Now, seizures in critically ill patients are very common. About 20% of critically ill patients get them. Seizures are quite dangerous. They lead to brain damage, and doctors will do a lot to prevent you from getting a seizure. In fact, they will sometimes give you medicine to turn off part of your brain to prevent your brain from destroying itself with one of these seizures. And the only way to detect seizure-like activity is with these EEG monitors. So it's the only way you can do it because these are not seizures where people are like shaking. These are totally inside your brain. They're um, subclinical. Okay, so if this was you, there's a reasonable chance that at that point, doctors would score your risk for seizure using the two helps to be score that we designed, which is so small that it fits in the corner of a PowerPoint slide. And the name of the bottle comes from this two H E L P S and then two points to the B. So the doctors can memorize the whole model just by knowing its name. And so they would, they would look at your EEG and they would calculate if you have any of these things and how many points you get, and they would add up the points and that would translate into your risk for uh, a seizure. All right, now the thing about two helps to B is that um, it was designed by an algorithm for interpretable machine learning. And that, that, this model here is actually just as accurate as black box models. Um, the doctors can decide themselves whether or not to trust it. It's not like a black box where, um, you know, the doctor has to sort of trust the black box. Like that's not what happens here. The doctor can look at it and decide whether or not they want to trust it. Um, it has led to a huge reduction in the duration of EEG monitoring per patient in a 2018 validation study. In fact, it led to a 63.6% reduction in the duration of monitoring. And this is incredibly helpful for doctors because that allowed them to monitor many, many more patients than they could before. So over twice as many patients they can monitor now that they could before because they could take the EEG monitors off the patients who don't need them and give them to the patients who do need them. And that, according to the doctors, helps them um, reduce brain damage and save lives. Now, as I said, this model was designed by um, an algorithm where the selection of these variables, right? There were a lot of variables in the database. The algorithm chose which variables to include and it figured out these point scores and it figured out this threshold here. So it, the algorithm actually did quite a lot of combinatorial work figuring out which subset of features and what point scores um, and what risk values to actually choose. So even though it looks like a very simple model, it's actually a very a complex algorithm that chose that very simple model. Because you gotta, you know, you gotta figure out which subsets of variables are going to work together and how you're going to get them to work together to build something that's as accurate as the black box model. And the algorithm that we designed um, to do this is called um, an, the lattice cutting plane algorithm. It's actually, a, it's actually a specific type of cutting plane algorithm. All right. So um, it seems that there's no benefit from complicated models for lots of problems. And I've shown you, I've given you two applications. Um, and actually here are a, a lot of different applications I've which, uh, that I've worked on. And for none of them did I require a black box model. So it could be like in the case of Compass that we're using complicated or proprietary models when we don't actually need them. So, and we're using them for high stakes societal decisions too. Now, in any case, there is a bit of nuance to what I'm saying here. So there are really two fundamentally different types of problems that we encounter in machine learning. And these are like totally like two different types of two different fields of machine learning, right? The whole thought process is like night and day between these two data types, right? Um, I actually have to kind of put two hats on when I'm working in each of these two um, with these two types of data. So with tabular data, that's where we have a good representation of the data and all the features themselves are interpretable. Um, whereas for raw data, that's like, you know, images or sound waves or large amounts of text. And for those, um, that's quite a bit different. Now for raw data, the only technique that's working right now are neural, is neural networks. 
Um, it doesn't mean that's always going to be the way it is, but right now the only technique that's really working for those types of problems, neural networks. Whereas for tabular data, you're not seeing a benefit from neural networks. Um, and in fact, as long as you're willing to process the data, um, you, you tend to see that all the methods tend to have similar performance, like what I showed you with the compass example. And in fact, what that means is that since all the methods tend to have similar performance, well, it also means that you can get very sparse models that have um, similar performance. So really tiny little models like decision trees, like I showed you with the, with the corals example, and then scoring systems like what I showed you with the two helps to be score. Right, those models even are getting at that level of, of accuracy. Now, raw data, it's really fundamentally different because it tends to live on very thin manifolds of feature space. So if you think about the space of natural images in sort of the, you know, the broader pixel space, which is, you know, the number of dimensions is the number of pixels. So you're in like a few hundred dimensions. Um, and if you think about the, the manifold of natural images, well, if you take an image and you edit even one pixel, then it, um, you know, it pops you out of this manifold and you, you know, this, this image no longer resides on the manifold of natural images. This is not a natural image. Um, and so you're actually out of distribution at that point. Whereas tabular data is a lot more forgiving. Um, it's, it's generally not that sensitive to changes in the data. Like if I change my exercise or allergies or whatever, like that, that feature vector could still, still be realistic. All right, so there, so we were, you know, thinking about this, like that there's no, you know, real benefit from complicated models for these tabular data problems. And we were wondering, like, why? Like, why is that true? Why are we not getting any benefit from complicated models here? Right? It seems like there should be some benefit to lots of extra complexity, but it doesn't really happen with tabular data, because as soon as you start adding more complexity, you just overfit. Now, I have a theory as to why this happens, and it's a very simple theory. And my theory is that there are just lots of good models. So let me explain this a little bit more. So my theory is called the Rashomon set theory. And the Rashomon set theory is, yeah, that there are just lots of good models, right? So if you think about the set of all models and you think about the fraction of them that are good, so, um, you know, well, it, it might not be half of them, but it's, it's a lot of them, right? And that set, um, this set should be large enough to contain a decent sized ball of models, right? The set of good models should contain a, a ball of good models. So then um, uh, if the set of simpler models is a good cover for the set of all models, then at least one of these simple models should be in this ball of good models. Okay, so as long as the set of good models is large enough and the set of simple models is a good cover, then the set of good models should contain at least one simple model. So you get a simple and good model. And um, this idea that simpler models are a good cover for the set of, of all models, um, I think that's completely reasonable. So for instance, sparse decision trees are a good cover for the set of all trees and trees are universal approximators. So I actually think this, this makes sense. So I'm gonna call this set of good models the Rashomon set um, and you know, named after the Japanese movie. It's all models that have loss that's close to the optimal on the data. So these are all good models. And now I claim that this Rashomon set is large in many of the types of problems that I consider. Now, in this paper with Lesia Seminova and Ron Parr, um, we did a lot of very computationally heavy experiments. And we actually calculated the size of the Rashomon set, or like, well, really the ratio of the set of good models to the set of all models. We actually calculated that for, um, for decision trees for about 70 different data sets. And we tried to correlate the size of the Rashomon set with lots of different things. And what we found was pretty interesting. Okay, so um, what we found was that large Rashomon sets, so lots of good models, that that tends to be correlated with the existence of simpler models. Okay, so I just explained to you why that should be true. So, so luckily our, our theory seems to hold up here. We also found that large Rashomon sets are correlated with many different machine learning methods having the same performance. So as it turns out, if you run lots of different machine learning methods on the data set and they all perform kind of the same, that is correlated with having large Rashomon sets. So in other words, what, what you're trying to do here is that you, you run 
machine learning methods with totally different functional forms. Like maybe over here you have like a boosted decision tree and over here you have a random forest and over here you have like score factor machine. And if they all perform the same, that means they are all in the same one big Rashomon set. And so that Rashomon set has to be big enough to accommodate all these functions with different functional forms. And so the Rashomon set is large. Okay. All right. So third, large Rashomon sets tend to be correlated with more label or feature noise. So these are problems where the outcome is hard to predict. So for something like criminal recidivism, for instance, it is really hard to predict whether someone's going to commit a crime within two years of being released. Um, there's just so much randomness in the whole process of whether someone commits a crime, then, um, you know, and it's just, it just adds, a, it creates an intrinsic level of noisiness to the data. And that noisiness corresponds to there being a large number of good models. All right, so the implication for these large Rashomon sets in many, you know, many data sets is that if I'm right, then, you know, there are lot, lots of good models for lots of tabular data problems, then optimizing for simplicity actually won't sacrifice accuracy. And this, if I'm right, has huge implications for a lot of high stakes decisions that are made using data in our society that deeply affect people's lives. And that includes criminal justice decisions that determine people's freedom, loan decisions that determine someone's ability to purchase a home, or medical decisions that determine life or death. Because if I'm right, then for none of these decisions, can we really justify the use of black box models? For none of them. All right, so now this theory reveals why we were able to find accurate models for these data sets without losing predictive performance. It's because these data sets emit many good models, right? They're all tabular and they all have noise because we're predicting things that are inherently difficult to predict. So let me go back for a minute to the results of our fact paper that I just walked through. And I want to focus on the second one because, you know, this, this idea that many different machine learning methods having the same performance means that you have like large Rashomon sets, right? That, that's correlated with large Rashomon sets. So that result is really useful because what, what I'm saying here is that if you run like lots of different machine learning methods on the data and you get the same performance, then you can decide whether it's worthwhile to run something more computationally expensive to get a more interpretable model because you probably will be able to maintain accuracy. Now, I want to tell you about a case where we did this. And that is the, um, uh, I'm going to talk about the data set for the um, explainable machine learning challenge. Okay, so FICO gave us this data set about loan decisions, and they said, make a black box and explain it. And the question is whether or not we need to do that. All right, so just a little bit about the data set, 10,000 loan applicants, lots of different factors about their credit history. And our goal was to predict whether they were gonna default on a loan. And um, uh, I thought, you know, I thought, could it be? I thought, you know, tabular data set where you need a black box. And so I asked my students to do some experiments. I, I said, could you please run lots of different black box algorithms on the data set and see if they all perform about the same? And the students came back to me in two days and they said, yeah, I'll perform about the same. So at that point, I, did, I knew that we probably didn't need a black box for this data set. And as it turns out, you don't. So I'm going to show you some models created <laughs> by, um, by some 2022 algorithms. So these are sort of recent algorithms. And I'm going to show you on this data set how they work. Okay? And, and the first algorithm I'm going to show you is fast sparse. So fast sparse um, produces sparse additive models, which are, an, this is an alternative to logistic regression. These are very, very sparse kind of logistic regression models. And this is vast. Um, and it's work with Jia Chang Lu, Chudi Zhang, and Margot Seltzer. Okay, so just to go back to this data set, um, the best accuracy you can get from the black boxes on this data set is 73%. The best black box AUC, which is another performance metric, is 0.8. You want to be hitting these performance metrics when you run interpretable um, models. And so fast sparse ran in about, it, it runs in pretty much always less than 20 seconds on this data set. And our performance is really good. It's actually really right on par with the best of the black boxes, um, you know, hitting right, right at those numbers. Um, the difference, though, is that 
it can actually produce models that fit on a PowerPoint slide. And so on the next slide, I am going to show you the entire machine learning model that Fast Sparse produced. And I can do that because it fits on a PowerPoint slide. All right, so this is the whole model right there. And so the way it works is that you get a score for each of the variables, each of these variables, you get a score for it, and then you just add them up. Okay, you, that's the whole calculation. You just look up your score for each variable and then you add up all the scores. So let's just, um, and, and that total score translates into your risk for, of defaulting on a loan. So let's take a look at some of the factors here. So months since oldest trade open. So if your oldest trade is, um, if your oldest trade is recent, like within the last hundred months, then you get a lot of risk points because your, your oldest trades are not that, you know, they're all recent. Um, and then if, you know, let's take a look at the number of satisfactory trades. So if you've had less than 10 satisfactory trades, oh, that's kind of risky. So your risk points go up. Okay, so um, external risk estimate, here's another one. This seems to be a really important factor because it created a lot of steps in here and, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's got a nice high risk if you have a low value for this thing and, and it's like zero if you have a high value. And so, it seems to be very sensitive to values between about 60 and 80 in there. But what's really shocking about this model, um, besides its simplicity in describing this difficult benchmark data set, is that we created this model in under four seconds. And that's how fast this algorithm runs on average. It's actually, um, it's actually usually about four seconds. Now, this competition, as I said, they told everyone to create a black box model and explain it. And they told us this because they didn't know it was possible to create a model like this at all. And we did it in under four seconds. Now, um, I just wanna tell you about the machine learning method that created this really sparse additive model in just a few seconds, okay? So I just, I wanna tell you a little bit of mathematical details about it. Um, so if you're not, a into math, that's okay, it'll be done in like, you know, three minutes or whatever. But if you are, then you can hopefully can follow this. All right, so I'm going to start with sparse logistic regression. So this is just the logistic loss for logistic regression. And then this term just says, please make the model um, sparse, like give me only a small number of non-zero, um, small, small number of steps in the model. And um, this over here is um, just says make it a linear model. This is just standard logistic regression. Everything's linear. And then I'm going to use the standard formula for logistic regression to translate the scores into risks. Okay, so all of this is just standard stuff here, sparse logistic regression. Now to get a generalized additive model with those steps, the simplest way to do that is to transform the variables before you do anything as a pre-processing step. So for instance, if you have age as one of your x variables, then you can transform age into lots of dummy variables. And so now you've got a lot more features because you blew up the feature space, but you can create very um, flexible functions of age since logistic regression will give you a weighted sum of these dummy variables. So you can get these really interesting functions of age by combining these types of dummy variables. Okay, so like the vast majority of machine learning algorithms, to minimize this objective, we're going to use um, some variation of gradient descent. Um, we're using coordinate descent where you optimize one coefficient at a time. And since we want models that are sparse, we're also going to try to send coefficients off into zero to keep um, to keep the model sparse. So um, so we're, we're going to do coordinate descent. So iterate many, many iterations quickly, often sending coefficients to zero. So we came up with this idea for solving this using cutting planes and quadratic cuts, and it was really fast for solving this problem, and we were really excited about it. But then we figured out a way to do it that didn't involve cutting planes and quadratic cuts, and it was much simpler, and it was five times faster. And so <laughs> and that involved changing the problem just slightly. So I'm going to take the logistic loss, and I'm going to change it to actually exponential loss. So this is a different loss function. Um, it's actually this, it's, it's actually the same loss function that's used in add a boost for, or boosted decision trees. And the probabilistic model is almost the same. And so now we're doing, doing sparse exponential loss classification instead of logistic regression. But the nice thing is that it's literally almost the same, right? The, the whole, you know, the way even you get the risks are even almost the same. It's almost the same formula. The only difference is the twos over here. So the big difference though, between logistic um, regression and exponential loss 
uh, classification is that exponential loss has an analytical solution for the line search at every iteration of coordinate descent. So if you're doing some kind of line search, um, like one step of coordinate descent, and you want like the line search minimizer, um, typically you would need to sort of walk down your loss function to get to the minimizer and you might like overshoot and go back and so on. But for our calculation, we can just go straight to the bottom using a formula. And it's kind of a crazy formula. It's, it looks like this. And it says, if this is zero, do this. And if this is not zero, do something else. It's, it's, it's a crazy formula, but you can calculate it. So we don't actually need cutting planes. We don't need quadratic cuts. We need nothing. We just go straight to the bottom. And that makes it really fast because we can iterate very, very quickly over iterations. And that's how we find the minimizer so quickly. So at every iteration, we just update one of these Ws in the coefficient vector um, using the formula on the previous slide. Uh, and we use a priority queue to keep track of which of these coefficients to update next. And we keep just updating until we've converged. And we get really sparse models really quickly. All right, so I'm gonna go back to the FICO data set here. Now the algorithm transformed the data set into 1900 um, and 17 binary features, and it iterated through subsets of them to pick out these 21 features, these like 21 steps, and it did that in four seconds. Okay, so, so far, I've talked to you about the Rashomon set theory, which is that simpler models exist when there are a large number of almost optimal models. Um, the fact that, you know, if you run a lot of machine learning algorithms and they all perform similarly, it could be because you have a large Rashomon set. And if you try to predict outcomes that are uncertain, that are noisy, probably because you, it, it probably means that your problem has a large Rashomon set, probably means you could get a simpler model. And if you do have a large Rashomon set, algorithms like fast sparse can probably find a sparse accurate model. And in fact, um, even on competition data sets, we found interpretable models that people didn't even know existed. And this has huge implications for criminal justice loan decisions and other high stakes decisions, because in these cases, our theory makes it much harder to justify the use of a black box. But I am not done yet. All right, now it's worthwhile to point out here that lots of machine learning people don't want to hear about this. They are just not interested. And these ideas about producing simple models, that is really not what mainstream machine learning has been focusing on. They are, and they've always been focused on building more complex models, mainly for computer vision, and they're interested in preventing overfitting. Now, I'm going the other way, right? I, I want to know how, how simple we can go, right? How, how simple we can go and still maintain performance. I don't need to prevent overfitting. My models are simple enough that they don't overfit. So it's really just a very different perspective on machine learning, right? It's not even what we typically think of as machine learning. All right, so let's go into the next topic, which is sparse decision trees. So decision tree algorithms, they've been popular since the very beginning of machine learning. Um, the main problem that's always plagued decision tree algorithms is their lack of optimality because they've always been these kind of greedy myopic algorithms like card and C4.5 that build trees from the top downward and then they greedily prune them back afterward. And the problem is that if a greedy algorithm chooses the wrong split at the top of the tree, well, there's no way to undo it because you've already chosen it and the algorithm doesn't go back and unchoose things. So here, if I'm trying to predict whether I'm going to get into traffic on my way home from work, maybe rain wasn't the first question that I should be asking if I want a small tree. But a greedy algorithm picked it and so now I'm stuck with it. So these greedy algorithms produce suboptimal trees, but it's really hard to improve over the greedy methods because decision tree optimization is really hard, both theoretically and practically, right? There's a combinatorial explosion in the number of possible trees that we could consider. Um, and in fact, optimal sparse decision trees is NP-hard. It's factorial in the number of variables. And so that's why, um, you know, people have been constructing greedy trees since the 1970s in the beginning of AI. So um, luckily, well, I don't know if luckily, but somehow this has become a very popular research area lately for some reason. Um, I've been working on it for like 10 years. The latest method that we've produced is called GHOST. And this, is, um, this algorithm 
uses dynamic programming with bounds um, that reduce the search space of trees. And I, I'm just going to put up pictures of the army of people that we've had working on Ghost. Ghost is very fast. It's much faster than um, the previous algorithms for decision trees. So I'm going to tell you about Ghost for a little while. Um, so, so this is one of the problems that Ghost solves, where it tries to keep the model having both a low misclassification error and um, to keep the model sparse by having a small number of leaves in the tree. And if we solve this problem to optimality, we get sparse accurate trees like the one that's here on the, this is the one, this is a tree that we produced on that Florida re-arrest data that I showed you at the beginning of the talk, this is the, the compass data set. So if you look at some of the tree, it says, do you have more than three prior offenses? If so, predict you'll be arrested within two years of your compass score calculation. If not, I have to ask about your age. Are you less than 26? Um, uh, oh, you're more than 26? Okay, I'll predict no arrest. Um, and then, you know, if yes, you're younger than 26, okay, how many prior offenses have you had? And so on. All right, so Ghost is a dynamic programming algorithm. So it deals with lots of subproblems. So to figure out what is the best split on the top of the tree, you know, to figure out the optimal split at the top, you've got to figure out that if you made that split, what would be the um, optimal split beneath it? And then if you made that split, what would be the optimal split below that? And then eventually, like you just, you have to figure out from the, you know, to get the top one, you've got to get all everything below it, figure out the optimal split for everything below it. And eventually um, that one is a leaf. And so, yeah, you, you deal with lots of sub problems all the time. So a sub problem is to find an optimal tree for a subset of the data. And, um, yeah, each subproblem, that's the, the goal is to find an optimal subtree for a different subset of the data set. So um, that subproblem in our in Ghost is represented by a binary vector. So if I think about the master problem that includes the whole data set, it's just a vector of ones because you're including all of the data points in the subproblem. And then if you um, if you split the data into two pieces, you have some of the data going one way and some of the data going the other way. So here I've kept the first data point, third point, fourth point, sixth point, that all is in this subproblem, and then the other data points are in the other subproblem. Okay, so those, those data points are in this subproblem. Okay, so Ghost starts from the master problem that includes all the data, and then it constructs a very large dependency graph that holds all of the subproblems that it encounters during the computation. So here it's trying out different possibilities for the top split in the decision tree. And then um, here are some possibilities for the second split in the tree over here and over here. And you can see it's, it's showing me like all of the subproblems that it creates. Like here are all these different subproblems where it makes different, tries out different splits and you can see which data points are in which subproblem. Um, and for each subproblem, it keeps track of upper and lower bounds on the, the objective, on, on the, the um, ghost subjective function, which is, you know, loss plus regularization. And it, um, it cycles through these subproblems according to a priority queue, seeing which subproblems are solved. And when it solves a subproblem, um, when it gets to a small subproblem, it can solve that. And then it propagates the solution all the way back up to the top. And so it cycles through these subproblems, trying to solve them all, and it propagates the upper and lower bounds upwards through this dependency graph. And then it can eliminate parts of the graph where we know, like, you know, this, this part of the subgraph is going to lead to suboptimal solutions. So we don't even need to look there. So these graphs, they can get really big because you're looking at tons and tons of subproblems, but we prune them efficiently using um, a set of theorems. Okay, so I want to go back to the FICO data set, which is my sort of muse today. And I want to show you how Ghost performs on this data set, because again, it produces a model that can fit on a PowerPoint slide. So this is the um, decision tree that Ghost produces on this FICO data set. And you can, um, you can um, look at this tree and see what it says, okay? So this tree, by the way, um, just to remind you about the data set, um, 10,000 data points, over 1,900 binary features, training accuracy of this tree, 72%, best of the black boxes is 73. Test accuracy is almost the same as training accuracy, so we're in good shape. 
This tree has 10 leaves. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10, okay? 10 leaves. This tree was produced in 8.1 seconds. So let's just look at the tree. So it says, if your external risk estimate is too high or too low, like if it's a really low number, we'll predict you're risky, right? Just like, just like in the other model. And then if um, your external risk, risk estimate is, um, is, is a good, if you get a very high number for that, then your class is predicted to be zero. Um, if your external risk estimate is somewhere in the middle, I have to start asking you these more nuanced questions, like what percent of trades do you have with a balance? And how many months has it been since your most recent inquiry? And you know, how many months have you been in file and stuff like that? Okay, so just to remind you, this is not an easy data set. This is a benchmark data set. And we did not know that it was possible to construct a single decision tree with this level of accuracy until we did it. And in fact, with this, without this algorithm, I don't know that we could get to this level of sparsity and maintain black box performance, right? This is the kind of result that we've been aiming for over the last 10 years. And I'm, I'm thrilled after so many years that we actually got there. All right, so I hope you're getting closer to understanding the implications of the existence of interpretable models, because you know this really makes it hard to justify using black box models for high stakes applications. But there's a lot more of the story here. And there's something that's been eating at me for quite a while. Something's broken. What the machine learning world is trying to create, that is clearly not what the world needs for high stakes decisions. Right? We need models that are trustworthy, models that people can criticize, that people can easily double check, right? especially for high stakes decisions. These overly complicated models, they are not going to cut it. But guess what? My simple models won't cut it either because the whole paradigm of machine learning is just wrong for all of these problems. So let me explain. So the, uni the, the way that machine learning has universally been set up, the sort of universal paradigm of machine learning, is that you take your training set, put it into a machine learning algorithm which minimizes some kind of loss on the training set and get a predictive model out the other side that predicts Y from X. And your model could be a decision tree, it could be a um, random forest, it could be a neural network, it could be a linear model, support vector machine, kernel regression, generalized additive model, whatever, right? This is the standard approach. We do this for essentially all machine learning applications, even for self-supervised applications, you predict some kind of Y from some kind of X using a model. It's really a universal way that machine learning is set up. But I claim that it's fundamentally flawed and we should just reconsider this whole thing for high stakes decisions. And here's why. So these are all people that I work with. They're all domain experts. So Dan Wagner is, um, he was a um, deputy superintendent at the Cambridge Police Department. And I worked with him on trying to design algorithms that um, determine whether a new crime is part of a crime series with older crimes. And this code is used by the NYPD. Um, Fidesz and Joseph, I work with on computer-aided mammography using interpretable neural networks. With Xiao, I work with him on um, wearable devices and heart monitoring. With Ed and Dave, I work on studying the uh, HIV reservoir in humans, which is where all of the um, HIV virus hides in your immune system. And then Brandon, I've been working with for over 10 years, and I worked with him on the two helps to be score, and I'm still working with him on care of critically ill patients. Now, these people are all very different from each other. Um, they all work on different topics. Some of them are doctors and some of them are police officers. The thing, though, that's common to all of these people is that they've all at some point told me that I was wrong. So when you work with domain experts and you go to great lengths to bring them a model they can criticize, they will do it. They'll say, I think something's wrong with this model. Can you build one that doesn't depend on this variable in this way? Or is there another model that um, doesn't depend on age so much? Or can you incorporate fairness constraints into it and maintain performance? Or can you just please tell me what is what else is out there? So the whole premise of the Rashomon set is that there are probably a lot of good models. And there are probably a lot of good simple models too. And if that's the case, why not let the domain experts choose between them? 
So I propose a new paradigm for machine learning, something that is more human facing than standard machine learning, which is to hand the user the whole Rashomon set, not just one model, but many good models and let them choose which model they want so they can pick something that doesn't just agree with the data, but that also agrees with their domain knowledge. Right, so this is my, my proposal for a new paradigm for practical machine learning. But how do we get it to work? So let me show you our attempt to do this. So I'm going to talk to you about a very recent paper um, that was presented at NeurIPS just um, in December. Um, and it actually solves this problem for sparse decision trees. And this is an algorithm called tree farms, and it produces all, um, all almost optimal sparse decision trees. It's pretty amazing because like even to find one optimal sparse tree is NP hard, right? So I already told you that this thing finds all of them in minutes and it's implemented at ghost. So it leverages ghosts way of representing sub problems as bit vectors and it's graph dependency ideas. But it also has a really interesting way of keeping track of subproblems. It stores all the trees in an implicit way. So it doesn't enumerate them, but it tells you how to like combine different parts of different trees to produce the whole Rashomon set. So you can kind of loop through it if you want to. So even if the Rashomon set is absolutely huge, you can still store it and work with it. And so the authors here are Ray Sheen, who's an undergraduate, Takuya Takagi, Judy Jung, Margo Seltzer, and Jia Chen. Okay, so um, what I want to, and, and also Tree Farms also um, had an interface built for it. Uh, this interface was built by uh, a really gifted young, um, com, uh, really young human computer interaction expert called Jay. And I want to actually show you um, Timber Track operating on Tree Farms. So this is the interface for Tree Farms. So I'm going to stop sharing the screen and I'm going to share a different screen here where I've got Timber Track uh, open here. And um, you should be able to see it here. Um, so what you can do, um, this has the currently the compass data set loaded up onto it. It has also a few other data sets too. But what you can do is look at all of the trees that are in the Rashomon set. So if you want to have trees, let's say you want trees that start with like number of prior crimes greater than three. So you can restrict yourself to just those trees. And then if you find some trees that you like, um, you can just put them over here if you want to keep them. And like, let's say you want the top split to be number of prior crimes greater than three, then you want to split on age um, less than 21. And then maybe you want to split on no, no juvenile crimes or something like that. And then it'll show you all the trees that have that. And if you find one you like, you can, you can keep it. Um, you can put a little heart next to it. Um, you can write a little note uh, saying, you know, like, you know, my, my favorite tree, <laughs> something like that. Um, you can also, also display the tree in an interesting way. Like if you want to display the tree um, by, by the number of samples that go into the leaves. So here you can see like a third of the samples go this way, two thirds of the samples go this way. This leaf is really small. Um, so yeah, you can, you can do a lot with, um, with tree farms. And if you decide you don't like what your choices were, you can go back and, um, and just start it all over again. Now I want to point out that this is all public. Like I've just gone to a website. So anybody can go to this website and just do what I did. Like there's nothing here that I did that was at all on my computer, um, nothing like that. Okay, so I'm gonna go um, just back to the slides here. Um, there we go. Great, so hopefully now that we have these, the, that we have tree farms um, in TimberTrack, we can hopefully provide something more useful to practitioners. And this is where I think we should be focusing on these more like human facing questions for AI. So just to summarize, I talked about the Rashomon set theory. I talked about fast sparse for, um, you know, sparse generalized additive models. Uh, I talked about um, ghost. So uh, for, for optimal sparse decision trees, and I want to point out again that this has huge implications for criminal justice, loan decisions, and other high stakes decisions, um, particularly if we can provide users the freedom to choose between models. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Cynthia. That was an extremely engaging presentation. I feel like I want to be in all of your classes now. <laughs> Um, we're pleased to move into the discussion period and welcome questions. There's been quite an active chat, uh, chat conversation. 
Um, if you want to, I've queued them up, but if you want to um, ask a question, please raise your hand and I'll try to jump in and grab those ones as well. Um, I will start with the first question. We had a question from Debraj who said, who asked, when you were showing us the results of the FAST algorithm on the FICO loan data set, in reference to the generative additive model fast sparse algorithm, are the results equivalent to the weight vectors for boosted trees? And then similar, a follow-on question about pre-processing. Do you have to pre-process, like normalize the input data or remove correlated inputs or something like that? Okay, so let me answer the first question about the weights. So Adaboost has two types of weights. It has one type of weight, which is on the data points and another type of weight, which are the coefficients for the weighting of the trees. So the, the, the size of the steps that I showed you, that is equivalent to the second one that I mentioned, the coefficients, um, because all of our trees are just step functions. So if you think about a weighted sum of trees here, it's like a weighted sum of step functions. Um, where we, I don't, I mean, I view the weights on the data points as, as being kind of, um, I know it's, I know that some, some people view that as a central thing for Adaboost, but um, I don't view it as, as so. I view it as part of that coordinate descent calculation. And I have a lot of notes. Um, on, I did my thesis on Adaboost. So um, I have a lot of notes online that explains why I view it that way. Okay. And then the second question is, do you have to pre-process? You have to pre-process the data in the sense that you have to create all of these step functions, like the dummy variables. Um, do you have to normalize the input data? Well, they're all dummy variables. So um, they're all normalized anyway, because their values are either zero or one. They're all binary um, variables now because we turned all the real valued stuff into binary stuff. Um, so it's all one hot. Everything's one hot. Do we remove correlated inputs? Um, we don't remove correlated inputs. Um, although if you want to run, uh, if you want to run um, a ghost, if you want that to run faster, then we have some ways to to do that, which is you can run boosted decision trees and just only use the thresholds that boosted decision trees uses. And so that actually will speed up your computation a lot. In that case, you're not guaranteed to get an optimal solution, but you're guaranteed to get a solution that's as good as the solution the black box produces. So you, you change the guarantee, but um, but it still produces very good solutions. Great, thank you so much. So we had a question from Melanie and it sparked a bit of a conversation or discussion in the chat. Um, is it a key is a key advantage of avoiding the black boxes uh, so that you can detect uh, uh, bias or assess bias? For example, if race is a variable, there can be a conversation about whether it's race or racism that's driving the outcome. And I think you addressed this a bit, but if you wanna to add to that. Yeah, but I think it's even more than just racial bias. It's also like missing variables. So like you, you look at your you look at your predictions and you're like, oh man, like I, you know, we're relying very heavily on that variable. That variable is, you know, we shouldn't be relying on that because it's 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 bad, or or we we've totally missed this other variable that we should be including. Um, so there's a lot of like, you know, or or you can you can sometimes come up with like you can find really bad problems in your data set when you have interpretable models. Um, and so it's, it's racial bias. That's you know that's clearly the reason I think we that's clearly one of the reasons I think we should not be using compass but I think the problem is even worse that like typos as inputs to people's scores can give them years of extra prison time and that's not how the criminal justice system is supposed to work it's not supposed to be a random process where a typo causes you to get extra prison time yeah and I think what you're talking about here is that it gives um, some agency to the decision maker that's making use of these algorithms, right? That they can see inside what's happening versus just saying, here's the answer. Yes, they'll reoffend or no, they won't. Yeah. And also like for doctors, there might be um, information that's not in the database that makes that patient special. So for instance, you, you would look at that, the doctor could look at that patient and say, well, the two helps to be score is like one, but that patient, they look a little bit frail. Like there's something going on with that patient. I'm going to add an extra point and then they can calibrate what they're adding to what's already being considered. And since they know exactly what's being considered and how it's being considered, um, they can do a better job with that calibration. Yeah, excellent. Okay, so the next question we had um, was just about how uh, people wanting, Jason wanting to use your fast, to teach fast algorithms, fast sparse algorithm and ghost in their class. So if you have, if you have slides, pass them on. Um, yeah. So I have, um, actually, I just posted last week a set, a new set of lecture notes. I'm going to show you where they are really quick. Um, sorry, that's, 
fine. So I'm going to go back to my timber track. So hopefully nobody will ask a question on, on timber track, but I'm just going to see if I can locate my website. Um, so if I go to teaching, then this is like my, my textbook. And I recently added chapters on, um, this is, uh, um, some, this is a, a this is, um, a ghost, ghost, um, notes, notes on ghost. Uh, and, uh, it, it talks about like kind of the pre-processing and the ghost, um, dependency graph and so on and so forth. Uh, and then let's see if I can go back. Oops. Uh, you're not seeing that. Hold on, because it came up on a different screen. So stop share. Um, there we go. Yeah, so it this is the notes that I just clicked on here. It just came up. Um, and so you can you can teach Ghost using this set of notes here, and it explains the whole algorithm and how you know all the different steps here. It gives even some theorems that you can explain. Um, so let me go back to the This one. So those Amazing. that's where the ghost notes were. Um, just over here. And then there's a walk a, a set of slides, um, which is a walkthrough of ghost for a particular data set. And then for fast sparse, um, this this is the set of notes on fast sparse and it shows you how it works and it goes through all the computations with the theorems in a kind of a gent gentler way than the paper goes through. Fabulous. Such a uh, generous uh, researcher you are. Um, uh, so we, let me just uh, go to R Ravenna from Deloitte. Um, what are the conditions to determine whether the split of a tree is optimal in ghost? So it's whether the, um, okay, <laughs> so it's complicated. So you, you remember, it's, it's a, so we're doing dynamic programming, right? We were actually running a whole, a giant dynamic program. And so you have upper bounds and lower bounds. And if the upper bound and the lower bound at the top level are equal to each other, it means that the solution you found is, is as good as the solution you could possibly get. And so if the upper bound and the lower bound are equal to each other in the dynamic program, it means that you have a tree that is optimal according to the objective function. And so that, deter that determines that all of the splits are optimal at the same time. Um, yeah, that's great. Re related to the, the tree splitting question, um, is measuring homogeneity using GD index entropy classification errors that are a good way to split the tree and find an optimal root mode? That's from Asmita. So of course, we don't do any of that, right? We don't have any splitting criteria because we're actually solving the problem to optimality for a global objective. So we just say minimize loss with regularization and you choose, this, you choose the splits that optimize that loss. Right? We're not doing any greedy splitting using Genie and so on. But I can I can reinterpret the question as being, how good is CART compared to your thing? And the answer is, we're better than CART. <laughs> we're more reliable. We can do um, a wide variety of, of objective functions. Like you change the loss function, we'll give you an optimal solution, whereas CART really, really won't. Um, CART is very sensitive to imbalanced data problems and so on. So my answer is, well, for some data sets, CART does a really good job you know, for, for certain problems, but for a lot of problems, it doesn't. And without a guarantee on the quality of a solution, um, I don't see why you really want to use CARD unless you have a massive, massive data set and you don't really care about the quality of your um, performance. Wonderful, thank you. I do see your hand up, Yasin. I'm just going to go to um, some of the ones that had in the queue um, from Vivek, uh, also from Deloitte. How are the subset for the subproblems generated randomly, or is there dependence on the variable values? There, it's it's splitting. So if you if you you know you you take the whole data set, and the first thing you do is split it in every possible way, right? Split it according to every possible split you could possibly do, and that creates a whole slew of subproblems. And you got to solve all those subproblems. You enqueue every single one of them, and then from those subproblems, you split them all again, right? You you split them all again according to um, you know, all the possible different different variables that you can split on. And sometimes you can prove that if you make that split, it's going to lead to a suboptimal tree. Like if I make this split at the top, I'm never getting to an optimal solution. I have a theorem that proves that. So I'm, then I don't need to make that split. Um, but yeah, you're, you're splitting in every possible way to try to find that optimal solution. Um, unfortunately, one of the question, answer, questioners had to drop, but I'm going to go to Ren. Um, how would you choose the splits in the tree to choose a particular tree out of the Rashman set for optimal trees, especially to avoid bias at that stage? 
Well, once you have the Rashomon set, you can calculate bias um, depending on how you what calculation you want to use. You can calculate bias for every tree in the whole Rashomon set and pick a tree from that. Or you can look at the trees and just decide which variables you're willing to, you know, you want to have in your tree and where you want them. And you can use TimberTrack to kind of look at all those trees and figure it out. Great. And uh, Daniel's question, now everybody's talking about how great the talk was and I'm having to zing past it. <laughs> <laughs> um, if there is a feature which you decide should not be valued, why include it at all? Well, some, I mean, I hate to say it, even my own husband does that. Like he gave us a data set and he like, you know, and we, we found him a decision tree using Ghost and he was like, I don't think I want you to use that set of variables, that subset of variables. And we were like, now you tell us. It's just domain experts. They just, they, that's, they don't think like that. Sorry. <laughs> then you show them the model and they're like, oh, no, don't do that. <laughs> that that variable is not causal. It's like, well, you sent us all of the genes. Why are you, why didn't you tell us to remove those ones? But then they look at the model and they go, okay, now I understand and get rid of those. And that, it makes the model better. Great. Um, personal uh, insides there. Um, it, so Aisha, do you want me to ask your question or can you try again? I actually think oh. it's now working. Perfect. Yeah. So I, I actually want to start off on question two, since I know a lot of people are dropping, but want to hear your perspective as a woman within this field and also how your journey has led you to here with that in mind. Um, the other questions I have will probably leave to our uh, more intimate session where we have with our Deloitte cohort, but would love to get your, your perspectives on that since this is sort of the um, outlay of this series and while people are still online. Um, well, it's hard to attribute any part of what I do to being a woman as opposed to being a, being a very unique a person, but I think it's probably part of it. Um, but as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, I started working on power grid reliability in New York City. And, you know, I was working on these more applied problems um, because I wanted to see what machine learning did in the real world. And, um, you know, I found that I found that these these big models were not, you know, it, it make the model more complex, the less I could understand what I was doing and the worse it was getting for troubleshooting. And so that's why I decided to go the other way. Um, but I, you know, for for a lot of years, I received a lot of pushback. I mean, um, you know, I talked to my students now who were my students 10 years ago, and they said, you know, do you remember when I was your student? Nobody valued interpretability. Nobody cared. People actually really didn't like it. You know, the whole, the idea was that machine learning should do everything for you and you shouldn't have to have a human looking at anything. And I, you know, I disagreed with that. And this was controversial. Um, many people didn't like it. And now, now they've sort of come around because they started using machine learning for more high stakes stuff. But it was, um, it was something, it was something that was universally hated, essentially, this, this, you know, the topic that I worked on. And so, it was really hard to get papers into um, any publication venue with, with that perspective because you'd say, oh, I, I have a model that's equally accurate, but it's more interpretable. And they'd be like, well, there's no value in interpretability, so I don't see why we should publish your paper. Um, so, it, it, yeah, it was really a problem. Thanks for sharing that. Just a follow-up question because it leads into that um, space of acceptability people wanting to hear what you're saying about a particular research topic. And so my follow-up question was really around the topic of giving people agency for the models in which they choose. There's always going to be a degree of randomness, a degree of outlier uh, data that you have to factor into the models that are being selected. For people who are subject matter experts, what guidance are you giving to them in terms of the selection of the models they choose and also considering variables that uh, may be technically outside of their area of what they used to consider and in terms of how historically they made decisions? Okay, that's a really compl complicated and a very good question. Um, let, me, let me address a much easier technical question that was buried in there, which is robustness to outliers. Luckily, since we transformed all of our variables into these indicator variables, and we use a sparse number of um, variables in our models, they're actually completely robust to outliers. Like decision trees are really fantastic about that because like an outlier will only affect one leaf in a tree. Um, so it's, it's outliers are really, really something that we've got, you know, we've got that down because the models are all robust. Okay, so let me go to the kind of broader question. Um, so the domain experts um, from 
what I can tell, the domain experts, they don't really necessarily know what they want because they, they want the data to tell them, to narrow it down, to like tell them something, right? Because they, they can't process a whole giant data set in their head, right? So they want the, they want the, um, they want the algorithm to kind of narrow it down for them. But the problem is if the algorithm just hands them one model, they're like, well, that's wrong. And then, you know, that, that doesn't agree with my domain expertise. And you, you know, the question is, well, is there another model out there that does agree with your domain expertise? So if the whole machine learning paradigm is set up to produce only single models, then you've got these domain experts who are unhappy and there's no way to solve the problem. So by producing the whole Rashomon set, we can actually have the domain experts kind of scan all of the good models in an organized way, like like I showed with TimberTrack, so that they can choose their choose a model that um, agrees with their domain expertise, or they can at least understand what's in the data that agrees with their domain expertise or what doesn't. Mm, that's Does that make sense? Understand. Yes. Okay. I'm sorry, but I need to get going in like one minute because I'm teaching a okay. class in another building in five minutes. <laughs> okay, that sounds great. Perfect timing. Um, I think I just want to say thank you so much for an extremely uh, amazing presentation. I loved your metric of simple models. Can it fit on a PowerPoint slide? That's a great metric. Um, your talk was a masterclass in delivering a lecture. I love seeing pictures of your students and collaborators. Clearly a very generous um, and gifted researcher. And we're so thrilled and thankful to have had your time today. And I'm very envious of those students whose class you're about to teach. And I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Our next session will be in February 28th for a talk by Arisa Emma, an associate professor at the University of Tokyo, from principles to practices building an AI governance system. And also please join our SRI seminar series today, or sorry, tomorrow with Ethan Perez, our usual one. Um, upcoming links are going to be on our website, Twitter, and mailing list. And when you leave today, you will be asked to attend uh, to um, fill out a survey, please do that uh, as we're always interested in hearing how things went. And thank you again, Cynthia, for an amazing uh, lecture. And thank you to uh, Deloitte for your questions and to everyone for participating. Bye. Thank you. Bye.